Hello, and welcome to Moving from Chaos to Order in DevOps. I'm Alan Berkson. I'm the Director of Community Outreach for Freshdesk. We've got a really exciting program in store for you today. Today, you will hear from two SaaS companies who've had tremendous growth and success and who have built their infrastructure on AWS. Uh, you'll hear from the co-founder and chief technology officer of Chargebee, a SaaS billing solution that handles payments in 190 countries. And you will hear from the director of IT operations for Freshdesk. Yes, we have DevOps, and yes, we rely on Fresh Service as a critical tool to help manage our own DevOps environment. Uh, you will hear about some of the challenges they face as they built out their DevOps and how they were able to bring some order to their chaos with Fresh Service. We're also happy to have AWS here to talk about what's available on the AWS platform. Freshdesk announced at reInvent this year that we're all in with AWS, which means we've committed to AWS as our infrastructure platform, and we will continue to work closely with the AWS team to deliver a solid platform for Freshdesk and Fresh Service. So whether you're just getting started with cloud infrastructure, uh, if you're already running a hybrid private public cloud environment or looking to go all in, we've got some great stories here to help give you some guidance and inspiration for successfully managing it all. Uh, just some housekeeping notes, You'll, there's a control panel uh, on the GoToWebinar panel, There's you can ask some questions, so as we go along, please put some questions in there. We will cover the questions at the end, and uh, we'll get to them. So please, if you have any questions along the way, just pop them in there. Freshdesk, our, our mission is simple. We enable companies of all sizes to provide exceptional support for their customers. For external customers and internal IT use cases, which require multi-channel support, including social media or chat, we have our flagship Freshdesk product. We've got over 50,000 customers on that platform. Today, we're going to talk about our IT service management tool, Fresh Service. Even though it's been less than two years since it was launched, we've got already have over 4,000 happy customers. Freshdesk was founded in 2010. Our founders are veterans in the service desk space coming out of Zoho. Our CEO, Garish Mathurbutham, was a product manager for Manage Engine. He left Zoho because he saw an opportunity in the help desk space for a product that was easy to use and wouldn't break the bank. Our flagship product, Freshdesk, launched in 2011, has seen phenomenal growth. In January of 2014, we released our service desk product, Fresh Service. Fresh Service is built on the same platform as Freshdesk and includes the same intuitive user interface and ease of customization. We're, we're really proud of our investors. We've, ha we've had over $90 million in funding from Excel Partners, Tiger Global, and Google Capital. While we have some really great mid-market and enterprise brands as customers, we're also equally proud of providing a powerful and yet cost-effective tool for small business. We've already gotten significant traction with Fresh Service, and you can see some of the world's largest brands rely on Fresh Service for DevOps and IT service management. Fresh Service is a simple, efficient service desk software that's fun to use. Your service desk isn't just software. Our customers tell us it's where agents and users meet, where people meet technology. Fresh Service makes sure that agents are able to support users with ease, and at the same time, enjoy themselves driving efficiency and productivity. So, Without further ado, I'm going to bring up our first speaker. Uh, first up today is Chargebee. Chargebee is a SaaS billing solution for customers like Freshdesk to handle payments from over 190 countries. It offers payments and global transaction management, invoicing and accounting, operational billing, and business analytics. Chargebee currently processes around $300 million of customer transaction and is growing rapidly, serving a thousand customers in 48 countries. I will note that Freshdesk is a Chargebee customer and our CEO, Garish Mathurbutham, is an advisor and investor. So we're really excited to have Chargebee co-founder and CTO, Rajamaran Santhanam, up next. Prior to starting up Chargebee, Raman was worked at Zoho building enterprise IT network management, security, and compliance tools. Chargebee was founded in 2011 to power global recurring, re recurring revenue businesses with the best DAM billing and subscription management platform. Those are his words. Take it away, Rahman. Hey, um, thanks, Alan. Hey, guys, and thanks for choosing to be here today. So I hope uh, life is treating you all well. Um, so folks here in Chargebee, uh, especially the DevOps, 
they say we are like astronauts. We all hang in there, like in space, looking around to fix problems and improve things. So uh, please hang in here for some time. Um, my major objective here is going to be for the next few minutes is to make a case. It's plain simple. Uh, for charge B, there is an almost a mandatory requirement to be compliant with the payment card industry standard. So, um, because uh, we, we, we handle payments, naturally we handle credit cards. So, um, this being PCA compliant needs uh, processes in place. But um, those processes are not tech rigor. So, just uh, have a habit of having strictly adhere to the process that the PCA standard mandates. So for the next few minutes, uh, I'm going to take how I'm going to talk about how we take care of those process using fresh service at the same time uh, being built our service on top of the AWS infrastructure. Um, yeah. So Alan gave a, a, a brief intro about ChargeB. So so we are a SaaS-based billing solution for the customers um, like fresh Desk, fresh service. And so we have um, 100 plus happy customers across 48 countries and processing $300 million of worth of transactions. So this is what uh, drives us every day to come to work and ensure that our customers can rely on us to run that business. So yeah, so um, the pl our platform basically brings the payments, uh, subscriptions, and customers together for the SaaS businesses to help you manage your subscriptions lifecycle and ability to uh, adhere to the invoicing practices from whichever the country that you are in, the tax regulations that you are to adhere to, all those uh, uh, boring stuff stuff having to deal with the billing is what we take care of. So we make those problems, take off all the boring problems from you and make it interesting for our developers. So uh, when we started, um, when we started to look for an infrastructure partner, so we were looking at AWS, so we decided to uh, start uh, launching our product right on the AWS on day one because uh, we believed we could grow with them as we were aiming high and uh, they, they, they were very secure with the highest level of PCA compliance which we wanted. So as charge we accept the credit card details, the security is foremost and we went for PCA level one compliance, the highest level of compliance with thorough audit by an independent uh, yeah, quality secure assurance uh, auditor. AWS uh, by default had the highest standards in place with PCA DSS level one, uh, uh, validated by an authorized independent qualified security access. So we launched our services on um, AWS from day one and never have to turn back. PCA compliance is all about, uh, it's, it's, it's a processes. The PCA mandates to formally certain processes around any changes that you do to your production environment and have access controls in place um, that can be accounted properly. So uh, before more, before having a fresh service in place, uh, we used to exchange emails and uh, within, the within the DevOps team and the developers who's gonna uh, deploy the build and add more details about what is the impact this deployment is gonna bring and what are the rollback options that we should uh, be aware of if something goes wrong. So this is what, uh, this is how we used to do in the early days when we, because the team is small and um, we're just starting on the PCA compliant. So, but at some point of time we realized that if you don't have process in place, uh, problems arise. And especially when things get rough, okay, when something goes wrong, so how do we track what made this issue. So how do you track the root cut analysis? How do you, whom do you talk in? Who made this particular change? Who approved this change? Uh, we re had a reviewing process. How do you go and track back, track back all those information so that we could really get to the bottom of that, uh, bottom of the problem so that uh, we, we get aware. So when it comes to PCA, it's all about accountability. So any problem that arises, so the PCA expects you to have a process in place that can take you back to who, which person uh, uh, initiated the change, who, who, was the, who was a part of the change advisory board who approved the particular uh, change, uh, change request. And everything, everything has to be in place to show them as an evidence in case of something goes wrong. So, so we realized that for, uh, uh, so naturally the PC level one uh, compliant forced us to implement the process and we found fresh service to be the apt tool to build the process around uh, and it has become an everyday tool for us to manage all the key processes 
that we need to get the rolling. So like uh, change management, the release management, and the incident management. So any changes that we could and make in the production environment, like let's say if you have to run a database query uh, to our database, so it's it's a it's a it's a change that we make in the uh, production environment. So there has to be a change request raised with the detailed information about why that particular change is needed because someone manually logs into our application server and making those changes. So it's important that that has to be tracked and someone else has to approve as a complete buy-in that hey this change is approved by me and I know if you do a rollback if something goes wrong we could roll back and get back to the older state. So so to change management, so every 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 change that we do in a production environment and every deployment that we, uh, every weekly deployment that we roll out are all tracked as a change management with all the changes that are going into the production environment. Even so even if you have to do a patch, it's it gets recorded over there. So every deployment uh, is raises a change 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 request, and after that, when the release is uh, tested and uh, uh, validated, it gets translated, transformed into a release management. And as for the incident management, uh, we take every uh, incident that brings in some some sort of disruption to our customers' ability to use our service. We record that as an in incident management just to ensure that we have an history of all the incidents that affected our sub customers' business in one way or the other, like a partial downtime to some components failure to a full-blown uh, downtime for a few minutes. So we track all these things uh, on a day-to-day -day basis using Fresh Service, our DevOps teams are trained to do the complete uh, uh, process uh, management through Fresh Service. It's been awesome with, for us so far. And so to just to make the strong point for Fresh Service uh, to do the pro to uh, follow the process. So the pro if you want to follow a process, you need care. So for that, so we the three things are accountability, the verification, and the process to roll back if something goes wrong. And and we uh, charge we sales uh, business to bus business uh, customers, so who rely on us to run their business. Let's say if we are um, have a downtime, so they won't be able to accept payments from their customers. So how do we translate that we care about our customers by having a process in place? To assure them that we are secure and reliable. Okay, so this is what this is where our uh, the need for a strong process comes from. We need to ensure that we care for our customers. So that's where the fresh service comes into the picture. We rely on them heavily, and they're pretty good. Um, everything we do, we do it via fresh service. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Raman. Next up is our own Krishna Jet Roy. Roy is the Director of IT Operations for Freshdesk. He is responsible for managing infrastructure, DevOps, NOC, and information security. Roy's got over 16 years of experience in infrastructure design, implementing large networks and system architecture for various applications with enterprise security management. He's designed and developed IT solutions for large enterprise to ensure that projects are structured to deliver maximum return on investment in the shortest amount of time. And he keeps us in line at Freshdesk Take it away, Roy. Hey, thanks, Alan. Um, so uh, I'm I'm going to talk about a uh, quick story about you know how we what are the challenges we faced, how did we grow? So we started off in 2010 with about six people, and uh, most of them were app developers. So we did not have an in-house IT operations team. Um, so hence, you know, we we went with a managed services offering, which was Engineer. Uh, however, when we started growing, you know, we uh, faced a lot of challenges. Uh, the number one challenge was that uh, adoption of new technologies. Uh, Engineer was very slow in adopting new technologies. There were new technologies coming up in the market, and they were not, uh, you know, so fast in adopting those technologies. The second challenge was. Uh, limited control over our environment. So, you know, obviously we wanted more control on our database, uh, more control of, on our instances, but since this was a managed services offering, they used to manage everything for us. So the control was uh, pretty less. Uh, the third challenge was obviously the cost. You know, when we were small, uh, at that time, cost was not a factor uh, for us, but as in we grew, you know, we found out that, you know, the cost was becoming a challenge uh, and, you know, we wanted to look at 
different options. And that's when, um, you know, we started looking at AWS. Uh, we started off using their EC2, their Redshift, their RDS, and other offerings. And, you know, when we started using them, we started getting hooked to them. You know, they, they, they were really good. Um, they, you could scale up uh, as, when you wanted. You could scale down. Um, um, we, we, we use RDS, so, you know, using the APIs, um, you know, you could uh, manage the shards in a very, very well-mannered. In fact, you know, one of my colleagues has written a blog on that. Uh, you know, if you, if you guys are interested, please go and look at that blog. Uh, this blog is from Kiran Tarsi, uh, who's one of the founders. Um, so, so, you know, uh, uh, also in terms of uh, you know, the way we were booting up the instances, we could boot up the instances in multiple AZs, so we have better redundancy uh, built into our application. So in case of a failure in a particular data center, we would still service our, our customers out of the other data center. Um, also, in terms of security, you know, the kind of certifications that they have, the kind of audit reports that they provide, uh, uh, you know, it basically um, uh, gives the uh, confidence to our customers um, in terms of you know uh, they, they are more confident that you know our environment is much much more secure so uh, uh, as I said you know uh, uh, we, we also realized that you know um, that adopting AWS is not very difficult uh, you really don't need hardcore IT operation people uh, to kind of manage your stack um, so we started building our own DevOps team, and you know one of our uh, senior de developer became one one of the best DevOps resources uh, that we have today. What we did was we started building our new platforms on AWS. Uh, uh, you know we we realized that our commitment with AWS is long term, and that's when we in uh, you know we invested on the RIs. And these are uh, these reserved instances gave us approximately about 75 percent, you know, savings um, on 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 our AWS usage. So that was pretty good. Uh, as of today, we are completely on AWS. We run more than 300 plus instances on AWS. And I want to quickly talk about one particular, you know. Uh, uh, one particular issue that we we had in the mid of 2014, we were attacked. Uh, you know, we we had a DDoS attack on our static website, and we had already moved all our you know uh, workloads on AWS except the static website. And uh, you know, we were down for about an hour, and uh, we were we were really you know thinking what to do. That's when what we did was we moved to AWS. Uh, we moved our static website also to AWS, and using the ELBs and the, uh, the CDN services from AWS, we could suppress the attack in a matter of few minutes. And we were really happy because that's when we wanted uh, you know, AWS to help us and they really helped us at the, at the right time. So we, we were really excited about you know, our relationship with AWS at that time. Uh, uh, we also uh, have enterprise support from AWS, and enterprise support is, is, is really a good thing because you know we have a dedicated uh, TAN. Uh, a dedicated TAN comes to our office every week. He sits with us. Uh, with any kind of you know architectural decisions or any kind of solutions that we are trying to build, we run it through them. They they give us valuable suggestions. And you know, uh, they, whenever we are trying to do something, we obviously talk to them because you know they tell us the right way to do do the stuff. So uh, you know, the en enterprise support is really a good thing. Um, we are also an AWS uh, marketplace. Uh, we are listed on AWS marketplace. We are an APN partner. Um, so those are some relationship that we have with AWS. Yeah. So this graph. Uh, shows uh, the the kind of growth that we have seen over the last uh, couple of years. So uh, quickly talking about it, um, you know, two years back, uh, we were approximately about 8,000 customers, and uh, today we are more than 55,000 customers. And we could not have expected this kind of scale um, uh, to happen if we were not using AWS. And AWS really helped us to scale to this level. So, you know, we are very thankful to AWS for that. Uh, fresh service. Um, uh, so uh, we we use our uh, we eat our own dog food. Uh, fresh service is an ITSM tool, um, and I'm going to quickly run you through some of the uh, features of fresh service. Um, 
So uh, this particular slide uh, is about how you manage your AWS assets, uh, you know, within Fresh Service. This shows the relationship uh, map view about different instances in your stack, how they are connected to each other. This is great from a uh, CMDB point of view. I'll just go to the next slide. Uh, the next slide is on change and release management. Um, so you could you could define the reason for the change. You know, if you look at it, uh, you could define the reason for the change. What is the impact that the change would bring in? Uh, what would be your rollback plan? Because it's very important that if you're making a critical change, uh, you have a rollback plan um, and al also a backout plan. So this this particular you know module gives you all all of these features and you know it's it's really great we use it on a day to day basis and it's 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 really working good for us uh, the next slide is is an integration that we have built in recently and this is still in beta but uh, uh, you know this is an integration that we built with cloudwatch uh, and uh, you could you could convert any alerts you know into tickets and uh, and then act on it. It'll tell you what is important for you and what is not important for you. So you know those prioritizations can be built in. Um, uh, this also has a workflow defined, which uh, which will you know escalate it to the next agent. So you know or to the next level. So this is this is really good. Uh, incident management. This is a typical example of an incident. Uh, you know, this particular incident talks about the CPU utilization being high on a on a database, and this is uh, in in North Virginia in U.S. East region of um, of AWS. Um, so I just wanted to give you a quick view of how how the alarm uh, looks like, how the incident management works in Fresh Service. Uh, Last but not the least, I want to talk about this particular customer. This is a great customer for us. Uh, it's uh, FX Pro. It's a financial company. They deal in uh, currency trading in their base out of London. And uh, DevOps is really, really critical for for these guys. You know, they cannot afford to go down even for a for a for a couple of minutes. Okay, so they they use fresh service uh, and they effectively manage their devops and you know they are really happy they are a very happy customer uh, they also have a consumer app which they give to the customer and uh, this mobile app is very critical and this also you know they this is highly critical for them so this customer is very happy with fresh, fresh service and they use uh, uh, their customers use these mobile apps and you know they 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 are one of our um, you know happy customers um, with the road ahead uh, with AWS, a um, couple of things that we want uh, to do with AWS. One is uh, um, we we are planning to use their uh, sub, uh, their analytic service that that they recently launched, as well as you know we are also planning to uh, use uh, the um, uh, the um, uh, the other services like Elastic Beanstalk. So, so it, it's been a great journey with AWS. We are a very happy, uh, you know, customer of AWS. The relationship is great, and you know, I want to thank uh, AWS uh, because of them we could scale to this level, and you know, we we've been having a great time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Roy. Uh, just a reminder at this point, we have two. Uh, uh, engineers and, uh, and DevOps managers who are on the cutting edge of uh, DevOps and SaaS. And so if you have any questions, take a moment to go to the go to webinar panel and type in your questions, pick their brains, ask them tough questions because we want to make sure that we get uh, some really good answers. Um, next up, uh, we're excited to have uh, Scott Ward uh, from Amazon Web Services. Uh, Scott is a solution architect with AWS. He's based out of Seattle, Washington. Scott is part of a team that supports AWS's global network of technology and consulting partners. For AWS partners, Scott's focus is on existing AWS architecture validation and improvements, planning new architectures for workloads on AWS, providing guidance on how to use new AWS services, and providing general technical enablement. Scott has a deep background in supporting, enhancing, and building global financial solutions to meet the needs of large companies, including many, many years supporting the global financial systems for Amazon.com. Take it away, Scott. Excellent. Thank you very much, Alan, and good morning or good afternoon or good evening, everybody. Thanks for taking the time to listen in to our webinar for a few minutes. I'm going to be building upon a lot of the things that were said today 
uh, by either the uh, customers or by Fresh Service themselves. Uh, talk a little bit more about why people are moving to the AWS cloud, uh, and then build on a few of the key services uh, that have enabled Freshdesk to be able to expand and grow uh, and meet the needs of their customers while still being able to run an efficient infrastructure. So what are some of the benefits that people are finding when they actually move to the AWS cloud? Well, it starts with really little to no upfront capital expense. With AWS, you get to really change your fixed capital expense to more of a variable expense. You don't need to uh, lay out a large amount of money for infrastructure that you then have to wait weeks, months, potentially years for uh, to show up. Uh, and then even have further challenges when you find out that that's the infrastructure that you don't actually need anymore. With AWS, uh, you get the infrastructure that you need when you want it, and you pay for it at the moment that you get it. From a low-cost perspective, AWS is always focused on offering lower costs to our customers. Uh, we have lowered prices over 49 times since our inception in 2006. And on top of that, we work a lot to get as much operational efficiency as possible out of our services, and we return those operational efficiencies back to the, our customers in the form of even lower prices for each of the services that we offer. Next up, you only pay for what you use, whether it be infrastructure, compute resources, or storage resources. What you use, what you provision, is what you end up paying for. If you run an EC2 in compute instance for two weeks with 200 gigabytes of attached storage to it, and then you completely terminate and delete that, you pay for the two weeks of compute time you were running and for the two weeks of the 200 gigabytes of storage you were using. After that, you're not paying for it anymore. This gives a lot of flexibility for people to start doing things like uh, run short tests or test maybe kind of the out of the world or maybe out there scenarios a little bit because they only need to pay for what they're using for the time they need it. When they're done with it, they can throw it away and they don't have to pay for a lot of extra infrastructure that's going to sit off in the corner and not be used but still consume a lot of power and resources. You can easily scale up and scale down. When we talk about that, you can scale vertically by actually making your compute resources larger or you can scale horizontally by adding more and more compute resources to be able to handle the workload and the demand that are coming onto your applications and workloads. And when you've met that demand and the, the um, amount of traffic or the requests coming on you are no longer there, you can then begin to scale down and retire many of the instances or the compute resources that you're using in order to be able to run uh, at a level that's, that's appropriate for the current workload that you're seeing. Agility and flexibility, once you've got services launched on AWS, you have the ability to change them. You have an instance that's running in a particular size, you need more CPU or more memory. You can actually stop and resize that instance, restart it, and in a matter of minutes be up and running with the same compute workload with the appropriate resources that you need. From a flexibility perspective, a lot of this comes from the ability to utilize the rest of the AWS platform and use some of the edge services that you might use to kind of help enhance your application, maybe from a queuing perspective, maybe from an email perspective, to launch and use services where you normally might be installing and configuring and managing those services on your own. And then go global in minutes. So building a data center is hard, and building a data center in another part of the world is even harder. With AWS, you get to take advantage of the 11 regions we have placed around the globe, along with the 30 availability zones that are within those regions. You can look at an availability zone as a data center. With AWS, you could launch uh, workloads in parts of the world that make the most sense for you to be close to either your business users or your end customers, as well as even have the opportunity to run the same workload or backups of that workload in another region around the globe in order to meet compliance or disaster recovery needs that you may have for your business or for the particular industry that you're running in. Next up is self-service. So AWS is self-service. You don't need to call up a support rep to be able to uh, do your work uh, for you. You get the ability to use the AWS management console to do the work that you want to do. With a few clicks of a button, you can launch and configure many of our services. Or if you'd like to live at the command line or, or really be hands on a keyboard, you can use our command line interface or our software development kit to be able to launch and configure the AWS services that you want to be able to do. And then from a security and compliance perspective, this is one of the reasons that we see a lot of people choosing AWS. Uh, from a security perspective, we 
really treat security as job zero here at AWS. We have a, a top-down approach. We have a dedicated chief information security officer. Uh, we have a global team focused on security at AWS to make sure that our customers are operating in as secure as environment as possible. And then from a compliance perspective, we have a lot of different customers that are running uh, either as startups or as enterprises or government agencies. And these different companies have different uh, regulations uh, that they need to comply to. You heard earlier from Chargebee that they run uh, on PCI. And so from the AWS side, we work with a lot of these different compliance organizations to get the AWS portion of the infrastructure that our customers run on top of certified so that the customers have confidence that they can run their applications on top of the AWS infrastructure and still be able to meet the stringent compliance regulations that are often out there for the industries that they're operating in. So next, I'm going to dive into EC2 for a few minutes. EC2 are the virtual servers here in AWS. These are your core compute resources that you would be running uh, your applications and your code on. Uh, this resizable compute capacity, so we talked earlier about being able to resize it, so if you're running with a particular configuration of CPU and memory uh, and you decide that you need something smaller or larger, you can resize your existing compute resource and in a matter of moments be up and running against that larger configuration. You get complete control of your computing resources, so once you launch an EC2 instance, you have full control of the operating system that that is running on. AWS uh, administrators no longer have access to that. You have full ownership. You control all the root access. You control all the keys. You get to determine how you want to harden the operating system. You own all the patching that goes along with the operating system. You install the software that you want on top of that operating system. It really reduces the amount of time to boot a new server or, or an instance to a couple of minutes. You're no longer waiting, dealing with procurement, wait, figuring out the lead time for a particular piece of infrastructure to show up and have it arrive in your data center and then wait for it to be racked and cabled. You go in and choose the configuration you need, either using the management console or the command line. In a few moments, you can you, uh, run the command to create the uh, configuration that you want, and it's up and running in a few minutes for you to use. There's 30 plus different instance types, which we'll talk about in just a minute, to give you a lot of options to be able to run the types of workloads you need to run. Uh, it can scale as your requirements change, so the instances can get larger. You can go to different instances. You can add more. Uh, you only pay for what you use. So we run with an hourly pricing model, so you only pay by the hour for something. So if you run it for one hour, you pay for that one hour. If you run it for two weeks and stop it, you only pay for that two weeks of usage. And it has a service called Auto Scaling, which we'll be talking about in a minute a lot, which allows you to add or contract the amount of compute resources that you're using at any one point in time. So this is a quick overview of kind of the broad uh, group of compute instances that we have. There's the general purpose, uh, giving you the very uh, micro instances with some burstable CPU or the M4s, giving you kind of a general mix of compute and memory. There's the compute optimized instances that are focused on workloads that are very compute intensive using very specific uh, Intel CPUs to give you that compute power that you need. They have some storage and IO optimized instances that have uh, very high throughput uh, local storage for very high read-write intensive applications as well as uh, very high amounts of localized storage. Uh, the GPU enabled instances, so if you have workloads that are very graphic processing uh, intensive such as scientific computing or maybe gaming, uh, the GPU instances are there. And we have the memory optimized, so if you have something that is very memory intensive, possibly a database, uh, the R3 family has a lot of extra memory so you can run applications to support that. Uh, not on this list, but announced at our reInvent conference uh, a few weeks back are also going to be the X1 series, which are focused on even more memory. These are actually going to start off with having two terabytes uh, of memory per instance, so you can run very uh, high, like maybe in-memory databases uh, on those types of instances. Next up to go along with EC2 is auto-scaling, which I mentioned before. This is what actually is going to allow you to be able to scale your infrastructure horizontally. You define metrics. Uh, either based on your application or based on EC2 metrics. For example, maybe something like uh, CPU uh, load average on your instances. And with those uh, metrics and those health checks, you can actually define when I hit a certain threshold, I want you to add one, two, or a certain percentage more EC2 instances to my overall, overall auto-scaling fleet, allowing you to be able to react to events and add infrastructure as you need it. So this really minimizes the costs that you need to be able to support your workloads. You don't have to have a lot of extra servers or infrastructure sitting there 
uh, in advance to support something that might be only a couple hour event. You go and get the resources you need when you need them. And then you can also have metrics that say when I've hit a certain threshold below, maybe a low CPU threshold, start retiring compute resources and terminating them and shutting them down because they don't need them anymore. And when that happens, you no longer pay for those compute resources anymore. You only pay for them for the amount of time that they actually existed. You can also create self-healing configurations with this option so you can define a minimum a number of healthy instances or compute resources that you want to have in your auto-scaling group at any time. If any one of the instances becomes unhealthy or there's a problem with the underlying hardware, auto-scaling will automatically replace that with a new compute instance so that you maintain your minimal level. And it integrates with the Elastic Load Balancer, which we'll talk about here in just a minute. So the Elastic Load Balancer, as its name says, this is a managed load balancing service in AWS. It allows you to load balance your uh, HTTP or TCP traffic down to your EC2 instances. So what this is going to do is it, it actually allows you to uh, span multiple availability zones within an AWS region. So think about being able to run across multiple data centers in a particular part of the country, allowing you to have compute resources in both areas in case there's a failure with one particular data center. The Elastic Load Balancer also detects when there are unhealthy instances behind it and will actually stop sending traffic to those instances so that you don't start getting failures back to your end users. Um, the Load Balancer is a managed service, so uh, it will grow and shrink the amount of resources that it's using based on the traffic uh, that's coming through. And it integrates with auto scaling. So as auto scaling is adding or removing compute resources, it tells the load balancer which instances are actually out there to take traffic so that the load balancer is always distributing traffic across those instances as much as possible. Okay, and with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Alan to uh, continue on uh, with the next part of our webinar. Thank you, everybody. Great. Thank you, Scott. Um, we, we have some time for some questions. We have quite a few here, so please keep them coming in. Uh, we've also put up a poll on the screen. If you can take a minute there to just uh, participate in the poll, we'd really appreciate it. Um, if you don't get your question answered on the webinar, we will definitely follow up with you afterwards. Uh, but uh, So here, let's get started with some questions. Uh, this first question is for uh, Ramon. Uh, if uh, we were to start with PCI compliance in terms of processes, where do you, where do you recommend we get started? Okay. okay, thanks for the question. Um, so we had the same, uh, uh, um, um, some of the doubts we had. So uh, one major problem that we face in PCI is uh, ability to have, having to support, uh, submit a lot of evidences that you had here to the compliance. So if you have very few people in your organization, um, best way is to engage with uh, someone from outside who will help you with cert getting certain evidences in place. So, uh, if you it depends on from where you are. If you are from India, we could refer uh, uh, one um, agency with whom we are working. Or if you are from US, we could refer. But if you if you have only one person working on the PCI, it's going to be very hard. So it's best to get some help from the third party services who help you with just submitting the uh, evidences to the QSA. Great, thank you. Um, th this next question is for, uh, well, actually, I guess it's for both of you. Um, th this uh, this user is uh, having some challenges in terms of scaling their database, uh, and so they wondered because of the scale that that you're working with, um, how have you uh, managed to do that? Uh, maybe uh, Roy, we'll start with you. Okay, um, so uh, on the database side, you know, we we've gone with RDS uh, and uh, we run RDS MySQL, and uh, uh, we have been able to scale our database uh, to a great extent. Uh, what we have done is, and this is something that I spoke uh, um, on my uh, in during my slides also, uh, is we have sharded the database. We use RDS APIs to shard the database in a very effective manner. There's a great great document or there's a great uh, blog that Kiran has written uh, you, you know you could uh, refer to that particular blog and tells you how we have uh, you know segregated a database how we have sharded our database and how we have been able to scale our database um, you know even when we grew from you know few customers to 55,000 customers as of today so I would definitely recommend um, you know go go read that blog that will give you a lot of insights Great, thanks. What he's talking about on the uh, Freshdesk blog, blog.freshdesk.com, there's a two-part series on sharding, on how we uh, sharded our database. Uh, you can you can check that out. 
Hey, uh, Alan, this is Scott. If I could I add a little bit to that, if possible? Oh, yeah, please. Yeah, so a couple of things I can add since you're, you're talking about RDS. Um, a couple of the things that exist, it obviously depends on the workload, but uh, when you talk MySQL, you can also create read replicas of those databases and actually have those out there. So if you have a lot of uh, read intensive uh, queries going against your master database, you can actually create uh, multiple read replicas that RDS will manage and point your reads or, or your reporting at that so that the master can really focus on getting in those transactions and the updates that are responsible for it. And then at the same time with RDS, you also have the ability to, uh, like we talked about before, kind of scale vertically. So you can add, you can change the size of your RDS instance to have more CPU or more memory uh, based on uh, maybe some growing workload demands. Great. And uh, Ramon, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I, I would I would concur with what uh, Roy has said. So my if you my SQL can be tuned to do a, to a great extent to scale actually beyond what you could uh, think uh, that my SQL scale. So you should look into the way your queries are executed, the execution plan of the queries, and look at the indexes. Um, so those things will get to a great extent before having to worry about sharing and all the next level of complexity added to the data, your uh, framework. Great. Um, it, it, here's another question, and maybe Scott, this one is probably uh, good for you to start with. Um, uh, for someone who's just getting started with uh, AWS, um, I guess there's there's always a fear of that you're going to make a mistake right out of the you know, from the get-go. What are some of the the most common or the biggest mistakes you see people make getting started um, with AWS? Sure. So one of one of the more or common uh, mistakes I see is people. Um, maybe try and go for reserved instances a little too quickly. You know, they talked earlier in here in the Fresh Desk webinar about using reserved instances, but um, and those, while they're while they're a great financial benefit, uh, you are committing to paying for uh, infrastructure upfront for a, for a period of time, uh, and people often will go in and choose those reserved instances before they have a really good understanding of what their compute steady state needs actually are before they actually look for a reserved instance. So uh, one thing I recommend to people is that run your workloads in an on-demand state where you're paying the hourly until you have a good understanding of what your application requires for a minimal. Then go ahead and purchase your reserved instances and then you can run on-demand or even spot instances on top of that to help offset any additional traffic. Um, to help minimize mistakes as well, what I'd recommend to people is leverage the AWS free tier. If you go to aws.amazon.com and search on free tier, there's a whole list of services that give you the ability to actually use those services for a free period of time. For example, EC2, there are certain instance types that you can run for 750 hours a month for a year and not have to pay anything for them. It's giving you the opportunity to kind of really understand how AWS works, how you can configure and use things on AWS with minimal to no charge for you to get involved and get your feet wet on that. So I highly recommend taking a look at that as well for the first time looking at AWS. Oh, that's great. Um, I'm actually going to put Roy and Ramon on the spot. I always like to say that experience is the best teacher, especially when it's somebody else's experience. Um, so would you, would you guys, either you be willing to share some of the, uh, mistakes is not a great word, but some, some, some things that people should look out for in terms of getting started with AWS or even as you're moving along in the process, getting more sophisticated, some challenges or some, some gotchas that you might uh, want to share. Yeah, so uh, Alan, I'll go first. Uh, this is Roy. Um, one thing is obviously, you know, you you need to have a good plan in place uh, when you move, uh, and also um, you should avoid, li uh, you know, listening to people saying that you should move to the cloud. You know, it's insecure, it's unsecured. You know, it's uh, it's uh, it, it's going to cost a lot. Uh, trust me, I come from a background where I used to run. Um, all on-premise hardware, and I moved to the cloud, and I now I can relate to the kind of um, dollars I could have saved, you know, had it uh, been that I moved to the cloud much earlier in my previous company. So, um, so my suggestion would be, you know, uh, try try out the free tier as uh, Scott just mentioned. Um, uh, have a good plan in place uh, before you kind of architect your um, AWS infrastructure. And then go, uh, you know, one by one, and you could use multiple tools. Like, you know, you could you could use their auto scaling, and there are multiple features wherein you don't need to, uh, you know, start uh, uh, going with a big bang in the beginning. You could go slow and then grow as as you as you want to. Great, uh, Roman. You want have anything you want to add? 
Yeah. So uh, one, one one mistake that we made was not to go with the VPC in AWS, which would have helped us a lot in having a lot of controls, access controls in place when we are going for PCA. So uh, even though you might not need, it's it's best to uh, have a long term look and design your architecture, like Roy had suggested a bit a while ago, and. Another thing I, I constantly hear about people is uh, they tend to run their, their own MySQL serve, uh, MySQL database in EC2 instances to save some bucks. So I keep telling them, so um, um, AWS hard is it just works fantastically and allows you to scale at different points of your application. Like you could have a multi exec and you could have a read replicas. You could, as you grow, you could just expand the RDS. So these two things I constantly tell to people. Great. Um, all right, I have to ask a, qu a fresh service question for you, Ramon, because it is a fresh service webinar. What, what, what difference has it made for you using uh, fresh service for your DevOps? Um, we know who made the changes at any point of time. If you have to get an audit in the middle of the night, if you have to wake me up and who did these changes, I just have to log into fresh service <laughs> and tell you. That's how it is. <laughs> and I know, and another thing is, it, it forces us to take a look at the uh, changes that we're going to make because that's. I'm bringing a couple of more eyes into the problem, the change I want to make, and it forces us to um, have a rollback plan in place because otherwise, fresh, fresh service will not allow me to even create a change request. <laughs> so fresh, fresh keeps you honest. <laughs> exactly. Yes, it, 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 it's essential actually because we are um, the customer's business depends on us, so it's very essential. That's great. Well. Uh, there were some other questions, and we will definitely get back to everyone uh, who's asked a question after the webinar. Uh, I've posted the uh, link for our, how Freshdesk uh, sharded their database for scaling. You can see that in the chat. Um, thank you all for uh, for for coming today. Uh, thank you, uh, Ramon. Thank you, Roy. Thank you, Scott. Uh, I know I learned a lot, so I hope uh, everyone else learned a lot as well. Uh, if you'd like to get started with Fresh Service, uh, you can sign up for a free trial, freshservice.com slash sign up, and uh, we can help you get up and running with your DevOps and Fresh Service. Thank you all for attending today, and uh, we hope you uh, Join us again for another webinar, and we will uh, send out a copy for uh, replay as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.